Are you passionate for the spiritual condition of others? One such person that was indeed was the Apostle Paul. And he knew the importance of instructing people in the truth of God. Wanting them to be ready for what God was going to do in the last days. And therefore he wrote the epistles to the congregation in Thessaloniki. Take out your Bible and look with me to 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2. Now if you were to ask me what is the most important passage to help us have a right understanding of the timing. Here again, not dates, but chronologically. What are the events of the last days? And where does our blessed hope, the rapture, where does it fall into this order of events? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is foundational. And once again, in order to make the right conclusions... To reach the proper understanding, we must pay attention to all the clues of the text. So look with me. We're going to study 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 in this section. We read here, And we beseech you, brethren. So the first thing that needs to be pointed out is, who is Paul's audience? And the answer is believers. What he's saying here has relevance for we believers. Those who have received the gospel. And notice that he uses a term of, of great beseeching. He's imploring. He wants the audience to know these things because it is a must. Once again, if we're going to be found faithful, if we're going to find the encouragement, if we're going to have the right understanding to see these events and understand their significance and respond in obedience, we need to know this truth. That's why he's so insistent. So look again, verse 1. And we beseech you, brethren, in behalf of the coming of our Lord, Messiah Yeshua. So once more, a big clue. We're speaking about that same word, parousia, having to do with the coming of Messiah. But once more, we have a problem. Because we do not know if Paul is speaking about the second coming at the end of this age. His return to Jerusalem, more specifically to the Mount of Olives, for the purpose of establishing the kingdom. That's why he's coming the second time. Or are we talking about this blessed hope? His coming, not to the Mount of Olives, but to the sky in order that he might gather us up. So right now, we don't know. But it's one of those. But if we keep reading, there is a scriptural witness. There's a testimony. Look again. In behalf of the coming of our Lord Messiah Yeshua, and here's the key, and are gathering together unto Him. Now, look at that phrase, are gathering together to Him. Now, as I mentioned, the New Testament was written in Greek. Not classical Greek, but what the scholars call Koine Greek. And many people, wrongly I would point out, that say Koine Greek is kind of a strict Greek. It's kind of a lesser Greek. Well, when we look at it in the New Testament, we find that it is very precise. We might even say so precise that it's awkward. And it's this awkwardness that caused people to compare it to classical Greek and say, it's not as, as good, it's not as accurate. I would strongly disagree. Because when we look here, we find an example of what the critics are referring to and why I believe it's so important to understand what is being communicated by this Koine Greek. Because we have something that in classical Greek, you would be graded down by your teacher. Because we had the phrase here when it speaks about our gathering together unto him. 
Now, let me point out that that, in my belief, and I think in most scholars, they are referring to the rapture. Because the second coming is not so much the church, remember the context, brethren, believers. The second coming is not so much us being gathered to him, but he coming to us. This is not the case with the rapture. Our blessed hope is that he is going to snatch us away from this world in order that we would be with him. So this makes sense. Our gathering together unto him. But here's the problem. We have the phrase here to come together. That's fine. And this should be the word, two Greek words, to come, then the word soon, meaning with or together. That's all you need. But in Koine Greek, they add a second prefix, the word epi, which means unto or upon or this emphasis of with. Now, that's fine. But when you read after this verb, that same word epi appears a second time, and the scholars would say it's needless. But in Koine Greek, when we have this redundancy, it's for the purpose of emphasis. And what the scripture is trying to convey, the reason why the Holy Spirit wrote this down in this way is to emphasize this intimacy. Not that you were just going to be with him, but he says we're going to be with, really with him. So it's this coming together. That's what stands out. And that's why I believe that it's a clear reference to the rapture. Now, if that's true, and here again, I don't believe that that is a debated subject. Most people strongly understand it having that reference, that context. It's the other things that we're going to see in a few minutes that tend to be more debated. And here again, we should never approach a passage saying, this is what I believe, and now I want to use the scripture to prove that. That's not proper. We want to reveal what the scripture is sharing so we can believe that. Don't try to justify your doctrine. Allow the scripture to give you the proper doctrines. Paying attention, and you'll hear me say this over and over, to all the scriptural indicators. It's vital. Slowly look and pour over God's word. So we read, look now to verse 2. For not, I'm literally translating, for not quickly being shaken, you, so don't allow yourself to quickly be shaken from, and it uses a word. It's a word for a perspective or a vantage point, a point of view. We see here it says, don't be troubled in your mind. Just not mind, but mindset. So apparently, Paul's saying, I have given you a mindset, something that you should understand, some perspective that you should have. And don't let, keep reading, he says, don't be soon shaken from this mindset, not by any trouble, nor by any spirit, like spiritual manifestation, nor by any word that someone might say, nor by any epistle, some letter, as though from us, and here's the key, as the day of, let's hold off for a moment, has arrived. Now here's the question. We have here the New King James, and I would imagine that that translation is somewhat different than yours. Here's the debate. Many of yours, if you're looking at your Bible, and I went through and checked this website that has 25 of the most popular English translations. And I believe only two agreed with this. Most of your translations will say, as though the day of the Lord has arrived, correct? Yes. This says the day of Messiah. Now, we're going to have disagreement. That's okay. Our marriage is based upon that, and we've survived 31 years 
It's all right to disagree. So the point is this. When someone says, I believe this about this issue, fine. Ask them about the day of Messiah, the day of Christ, as it says here. You will find that most pastors, most New Testament scholars, they, they will say, the day of Messiah, what, what is that? But if you look at the whole Bible, you will find the phrase, the day of the Lord, is, is appearing over and over about 20 times in the Old Testament. The day of the Lord. It's frequent. It is a day of judgment. It happens at the end of the end times. It's a latter end time event. And it is synonymous with the wrath, the judgment of God. The source of this tribulation is always from God. Do you realize that the day of Lord, that expression, only appears one time in the New Testament, secondly, maybe here, but only clearly among all the manuscripts that we have. It only appears for sure one time in 1 Thessalonians. Only one time. The day of Christ, the day of Messiah, it appears about five times in the New Testament. And it has a very different connotation. I'm going to prove that. Here again. Don't accept what someone says. Check it out. In the New Testament, this phrase, the day of Messiah, in contrast to the day of the Lord, which is bad judgment, wrath, the day of Messiah is seen, and we're going to go through all the examples in the New Testament in a moment, of this the day of the Lord of Messiah, Yeshua. Sometimes we have the day of the Lord, but it always modifies by saying Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Whenever that appears, and we'll see it, it's always in the sense of deliverance. The day of the Lord, judgment, consuming. Now, let me pause for a moment, go off on a tangent. Just so you know where I'm coming from, what, what I'm about in my beliefs. So often when we come across the day of the Lord, what we normally think of wrath, horrible things, I'm amazed of the number of, of biblical scholars, many of whom I respect so much, but I have an issue with them. And that is that they want to say, you know, we read about these things, it's probably nuclear war. We read about this, this is probably some new type of helicopter, new type of plane. This is, and they take all these things in the last days and they want to attribute them to the work of man, the evil work of men. The problem I have is this. When we look at the day of the Lord, speaking about, for example, book of Revelation, the bold judgments, all of those judgments where do they originate from? Heaven. Who brings them into this world? God. What is the purpose of that? To manifest there is a God and His judgment is falling. So why would we want to interpret it as some nuclear weapon that was created by who? Some man, some scientist, some school, whatever. It is wrong, biblically, to take what God says is falling from the heavens. And when we look at these things, there's no way that man could bring this about. It is God, and the purpose of these things is to announce boldly to the world, God is a God of judgment. He is angry with sin, and he's bringing his destruction into this world. It's calling the people to repent. They don't. So it is wrong to attribute these acts of God that are supernatural that man could never be a part of and attribute it to natural things. The works of man is wrong. Those are all day of the Lord events. Now, when we look at the day of the Lord, 
I mean, those events are very clear. One of the problem here, if we look at context, is that the Thessalonians, they are concerned that they've missed out on the day of the Lord. No. We all want to, right, miss out on the day of the Lord. We have a promise that we will. What's that promise? The blessed hope, the rapture. We are not appointed to God's wrath. That is a day of the Lord issue, his wrath. You're not going to have to ask anyone, did I miss out on the day of the Lord? <laughs> it will be very clear. Why? You're going to be rejoicing in heaven when that's happening. If you don't miss out on the day of the Lord, you're not going to think, did I? It's going to be too dreadful to experience it. So because of that, the context does not fit. The best manuscripts do not have the day of the Lord. The best manuscripts have the day of Messiah. The concerns of the congregation in Thessaloniki is that they've missed out perhaps on the day of Messiah. That person could be concerned with. That, the majority of the world's going to miss out on that. Only those who have received the gospel, they'll be part of it. So they're hearing wrong things. They're being told, perhaps they've missed it. And Paul is writing this second epistle in this second chapter to say, I want to set it straight. I want you to understand this event, which is the day of Messiah. And he links it together with our gathering untogether with, with him. So that's the context that cannot be denied. So let's talk for a few minutes about the day of Messiah. It's not an unfamiliar term biblically. Look, if you would, to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And look here at the context, what's being said. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and look, if you would, to verse, verse 7. It appears actually in verse 8, but let's begin in verse 7. We read here, So that you do not lack any gifts, talking about spiritual equipment. But we wait for the revealing. Notice the context. It's the word to reveal. Apocalypse. For the revealing of our Lord, Messiah, Yeshua. Who will establish you. How? At the end, he says he will establish us blameless. At the day of our Lord, Messiah, Yeshua. So this is one of the examples of the day of Messiah. Here it says the day of our Lord, Messiah, Jesus. Same thing. But you see it speaks about us being established, us being found blameless. Why will we be found blameless? Because we'll be in that new perfect body. That's what he's going to do. Now let's look at another scripture. Now... 1 Corinthians was pretty good. Let's check out 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 as well. And here it becomes even more clear. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 14. Mature believers are speaking to new believers. And he says, Just as you know us in part that you are our boasting. So what it's saying here is this. We are boasting about you. The change that happened to these new believers as they have received the gospel, as they have received to the, the apostles' doctrine, as they grow, these older believers, these apostles are saying, we boast in you. The work that God's doing. And likewise, as they mature, they are going to boast in us. When? At the day of Messiah Yeshua. 
That is the Christ. So he's saying here, when Messiah comes and you see the outcome of the gospel, meaning what? This new body, this kingdom body, this deliverance, God fulfilling his promises to the church. He says, you're going to rejoice and boast about us and the work that God did through us. When? At the day of our Lord, Messiah Yeshua. Not the day of the Lord and this judgment, but the rapture. Let's get another one. Look, if you would, to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verse, verse 6. Philippians chapter 1. We are confident in this, he writes, that the good work that God has begun in you, he will complete it when? At the day of Messiah Yeshua. So all of this is positive. It is all about deliverance. It's about the promise, the good work that he's going to complete. What does that mean? I believe it's a reference to this rapture event, this new body that we're going to receive. And saying that first chapter, look now at verse 10. Philippians chapter 1, verse 10. For the documentation... That's literally what the Greek word is. It's where we get the word to document something. In order to document the excellent things, in order that you will be pure and free from offense, when? At the day of Messiah. So because this day, when God is going to transform us, when we're intimate with Yeshua in the kingdom of heaven, we're not going to have anything impure, any offense. It's going to be a day of rejoicing. That does not describe the day of the Lord. It describes the day of Messiah, which is synonymous with the rapture. Now let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. All of this is laying the foundation for rightly understanding what Paul is going to teach this congregation. Look again at verse 2. That you are not quickly shaken from the right perspective, nor troubled, nor by spirit manifestation, nor by the word, nor by an apostle, as though from us, as though the day of Messiah has arrived. Verse 3, do not let anyone, what does your Bible say? Deceive. Deceive. Now, Yeshua taught a lot about this, right? We saw this in their first study. Paul's echoing the same thing. Don't let anyone deceive you. You know what that means practically? Study the Word of God. Be prayerful, seeking the Holy Spirit to be your teacher. So don't let anyone deceive you in any manner. That this day has come, or it might literally be, in order that unless the apostasy comes first. Now, if you look here at this scripture, verse 3, there's a problem. Where it says, for that day will not come. The problem is, that doesn't appear in the text. Maybe in your Bible it's italicized. The word come here, if you look here, the day will not come. That's not there. Unless the falling away comes first. The word will come only appears one time. In most translations, they put it twice. Now, it may be with a good intent, and that's trying to help you understand the context. The day of Messiah will not come until first comes the apostasy. Now, this is true on both levels. Why do I say that? We know that the rapture precedes the day of the Lord, correct? Correct. The day of God's wrath, we know. And we can also say, 
The day of the Lord won't come, meaning also the day of Messiah. Both accounts are true. Unless first comes the apostasy. Now, this is what's happening today within the theological movement. There is great debate upon the word apostasy. What does it mean? There is a strong teaching going around theological institutions in end-time studies that the term apostasy really refers to the rapture. Now, why? And there's a basis for this, I think an improper basis. But the word apostasy simply means, some of your Bible may translate it, falling away. It comes from two Greek words. One is to stand, istemi. The second one is apo, from. So we might have an English, and I'm so glad I'm speaking to an English country. It's much easier. You've heard the expression, stand down? I mean, don't do anything. Well, in Greek, when you stand, say, stand from, it means go away. It's just a go away. Stand away from this. So you can see how someone could come away and saying this, and they will tell you it simply means a departure. Is that true? Yes, it is. We can take that word, apostasy, and look at it and simply say it means a departure away from. I don't have any problem with that. But there is an issue. When it's used in the Bible, and it's used outside the Bible in Greek language, it always refers to a departure from that which is good. That's why so often scholars have said apostasy. What's apostasy? A departure away from truth, from the Word of God. Let me give you an example. Write down. I'm so glad to see people writing down things. It's such an encouragement for me. Acts chapter 21, 21. There, we won't look to it, but, but you can make a note and read it. Paul is being accused. It's that passage where it begins by saying, Brother James is speaking. And he says, you know, how wonderful there is that there's so many Jewish believers who are zealous for the law. You know that passage? And then he says to do something. He speaks to him. And he's talking about that Paul should take a... a, Not take a vow, but work with those who have taken a vow. In order to bring them through this this tradition of the Old Testament law. To oversee this because Paul was such a knowledgeable Jew, religiously. And the reason why he is told to do this is because there's a false rumor going around. That Paul teaches, and this is what's found in Acts 21, 21. Paul is being accused falsely as teaching people that they should depart from the law. And not to circumcise your children or keep any of the customs. Is that what Paul taught? No, it's not. He says circumcision doesn't save us. And if we're circumcised in order to be brought into a covenant... That won't save us. That's the false teaching going around. But Paul did not depart from Moses. That's, if you look at Acts 21, he is being accused of apostasy, departing from the teachings of Moses. Did he? No, he did not. So this is the only biblical example of this word, the same word, appearing. Now, it appears in verbal form for Departing, and there it's always a departure from that which is good where you want to be to where you don't want to be. And that's why it is wrong to say this departure that's being referred to in verse 3 is the rapture. Because in the rapture, we're departing from the world and we're going to have intimacy with, with Messiah in the kingdom of heaven. 
That's the exact opposite. We're departing from something bad, going to the one who is good. So this view of first comes the rapture, then the day of the Lord, that's true. But it's not the day of the Lord here. It's the day of Messiah. And this departure is not the rapture. It is, as it's translated here, an apostasy, a moving away from right doctrine. And by the way, we see that rapidly happening in the church, correct? Unbelievable things being taught. Well, let's continue on. Look again at verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you by any manner because the apostasy, it's got to come first. And then it uses the word a conjunction, not one in contrast, but can be translated even. The apostasy is going to be united with something else. And what is that? Well, remember we talked about in Matthew 24 and verse 15, Yeshua said that there's going to be, as spoken by the prophet Daniel, an abomination of desolation. Now, what is that? It surrounds the temple because of what Daniel says. It surrounds one called the man of lawlessness or the man of sin. But what exactly is it? Now, some scholars, and I would agree with them, points to an event of Daniel 11. But let me tell you the best place to get your answer. It's right here. Because here, Paul, pretty good source, would you not agree? He's going to tell us what is the abomination of desolation. And it's so significant that he's telling us that the day of Messiah, our blessed hope, will not come until something takes place. And what is that? It's what we're reading here. Unless the man of sin is first revealed, the son of perdition. This is the Antichrist. Now let's pause for a moment and go back to something we talked about earlier today. Remember, I talked about instability, those birth pains. And I said, Incivility is a catalyst for change. People in times of desperation, someone comes along promising something good and end the problems, most of the people will embrace that because of desperation. And this instability, these birth pains, are going to give rise to the Antichrist. See, the Antichrist is going to come out of an empire. And it is going to be an empire that puts down an Iranian empire. Now, how do we know that? Daniel chapter 8. In my opinion, Daniel chapter 8 is one of the most important passages in understanding the last days. It speaks about two beasts. Here's another important note. When the Bible, for example, the book of Revelation does this significantly throughout its study. When we find a beast, some type of animal being referred to, we know from the book of Daniel and other prophets, a beast is an empire. And we are told in Daniel chapter 8 that a beast is going to rise up called the ram. Now, so many New Testament scholars and so many rabbis look at Daniel chapter 8 and say, oh, it's a past time. It refers to Alexander the Great and those who would take over after him. There's a problem with that. Here again, don't trust me. Read Daniel chapter 8, verses 17 and verses 19. 17 and 19. It's a summary statement. And there it says that this prophecy, this vision that Daniel had was for the end times, the final appointed period that will bring about the end of God's wrath. Now, isn't that pretty clear to you? See, the reason why people 
think that it speaks about Alexander the Great is that it speaks about this horn that's going to be cut off and four is going to rise up under him. The number four, biblically, is a global number. It's a number speaking about the world. And what it's saying here is this, that there's going to be one leader that is going to be cut down and a new leader, that's what it says elsewhere. But here it says four. It means that this new leader is going to have authority over the world. And in other places in the book of Revelation, we're told about the Antichrist ruling over a one world government. Now, this first empire that is going to bring about great instability, it says that it's the empire of the Medes and the Persians, which is modern day Iran. And it's going to bring about barbaric events. And there's going to be a sense of hopelessness. And then pitomi, which is a Hebrew word which means suddenly, unexpectedly, without any evidence, without any signs, another empire is going to rise up. This is of that goat. And the goat is the empire of the Antichrist. And the goat is called from Yavan. What does that mean? Well, in modern Hebrew, Yavan is Greece. But you have to be careful. Because the term Yavan in modern Hebrew is Greece, but ancient, it speaks about an European empire. One that comes out of Europe. So what we know is this, that this final empire is going to come out of Europe. Now, this is what many people will tell you. It's very popular today, numerous books that says the Antichrist is from Islam. Let me tell you. The Antichrist, Satan himself, is using Islam. No question about it. But what's going to happen is this. Now, in America, i got to make sure that there's a difference between American English and perhaps Australian English. Do you know the expression? You can't teach this in Hebrew. Do you know the expression... Catch 22. You do. We're talking about a catch 22 situation because this empire that Iran's going to rule over is going to be bad. It's going to be Islamic. It is going to spread out of the east, westward, northward to the south. There's going to bring a sense of hopelessness, a sense of despair. No one's going to see any way to put it down. And then suddenly, there's going to be a new empire coming out of Europe. And it is going to put it down. The whole world's going to say how wonderful that is. But guess what? This new empire is going to be worse. Now, Islam, I mean, would you not agree Islams kill more Muslims than anyone else. That's a fact. It is a barbaric religion. In fact, I would go on record saying it is not a religion. It is a political movement masquerading as a religion for religious benefits. It's a political movement. You have Islamic states. Why? It's a political movement. It will manipulate religion for their political objectives. But there's only one thing that, that Muslims agree on. Only one thing. And that is their hatred for Israel. Their anti-Semitic positions. The Antichrist is not going to be anti-Israel in the beginning. You look at what the scripture says. The Antichrist is going to want to woo Israel. To worship him. The Antichrist is going to do a lot of seemingly good things for the Jewish people and for Israel. Why? The Antichrist knows something. It's something that most of the church rejects. And that is, Israel is foundation, foundational for the establishment of the kingdom of God. You all know the scripture, Matthew 23, which says Messiah is on the Mount of Olives. He's weeping over Jerusalem. Let me translate that in a more practical way. 
He is grieved over the spiritual condition of the Jewish people. Are you? And it's in your best interest too because Messiah says something. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and those who are sent to you, how often I wanted to gather you up as a mother hen gathers up her chicks, but you were not willing. He says, I tell you something. I will not come again, and this is a, a second coming context. I will not come again to establish his kingdom, in other words, until they say what we sung earlier. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If you are kingdom-minded, and scripturally, you're commanded to be kingdom-minded, you are going to be concerned about the spiritual condition of the Jewish people. You know who's one of my favorite persons in the Bible? The centurion. The centurion who had that young attendant that died or was at the point of death. And remember, he, he sent word to Yeshua that he would come and heal. Who did he send word to or with? The Jewish leadership, right? And they spoke to Yeshua. Think about this. A centurion, part of the Roman Empire, an oppressive empire. They say to Yeshua, the leaders of the synagogue, come and respond to him because he is worthy, because he loves our people. Here's a Roman that does what? Loves the Jewish people. And he's concerned about their spiritual condition. He's the one who built them a synagogue. In what place? Capernaum. And we keep reading in Luke, and we find that Messiah was impressed with his faith. Do you want Messiah to be impressed with your faith? Love the Jewish people and be concerned about their spiritual condition. Bring them to the truth of the gospel. Support the nation of Israel against all the nations of the world, turning against them in their false propaganda and their misrepresentation of what's going on with the Palestinians and the Jews. And why is this important? Because God wants to bless all the nations of the earth. This is his tool. We'll talk more about this after lunch. So the point is this. Satan knows the significance of Israel. And if he can get the Jewish people worshiping him, he Foils. He thwarts God's program to bless all the nations of the world. Satan doesn't want that. So he's trying to bring Israel to worship him, to follow him, and turn away from God. So what happens? There's this time of instability, chaos, hardship, sense of hopelessness, and this new empire arises. The Antichrist is the leader of it. He puts down the ram, that first Islamic empire, and all the world is going to be so thrilled by it. Watch out. Something worse is coming. And we are going to be the ones, believers, speaking against the Antichrist. Now here's something that's controversial. So you have to be careful of these theological bumper stickers. I'm not waiting for the Antichrist. I'm waiting for the real Christ. Sounds great, doesn't it? I like it. But, but is it accurate? Can it be supported scripturally? Don't take my word. We're coming to a passage. So the Antichrist, he is going to put down this instability. He is going to bring about a time of peace and prosperity, and security, even for Israel. And people are going to love this. But remember what Paul says. When they say peace and safety, watch out. What's coming? Sudden destruction. At the hands of the Antichrist and the judgment that's going to fall upon him. So the Antichrist is going to be doing great things from a worldly standpoint. Israel's going to be thrilled with the peace, the security. Here's something else 
that uh, is so sad because it's not rooted in the Word of God. Have you heard people say that the Antichrist has to be Jewish? You ever heard that? Very popular. And the answer is, well, why would the Jewish people accept the Antichrist if he wasn't Jewish? Where in the scripture does it say, show me one scripture that it says that the Israel is going to accept the Antichrist as Messiah and receive him? Now, they might applaud the security, the peace. They might like him as a world leader, but they are not going to receive him in the way that the Antichrist wants. We talked about early. Remember when I said Etzerah Hila Yaakov, a time of trouble, a time of tribulation for Jacob? What brings that about? You know what brings it about? Israel's rejection of the Antichrist. That's what's going to bring about a, a physical hell upon this earth. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But here's the context. The Antichrist is going to be doing a lot of seemingly good things from a worldly standpoint, from a material standpoint. Peace, prosperity, security, all these things. But from a moral, from a spiritual standpoint, well, where is he from? The pit of hell. And we are going to be speaking against him. And what is that going to bring about? Suffering. Persecution. Here's a misnomer. On Thursday, we were kind enough to have a radio interview with Neil Johnson. Really enjoyed his perspective, the kindness that he afforded me. And as we were talking, he said, well, this is really significant. And I didn't really realize what he was referring to until he stated it. Because he said, you know, what he had been taught is our blessed hope the rapture is being delivered from the Antichrist. It's not. It is being delivered from the wrath of God. That's what the Bible says. Now, when we look at the scripture, we're going to see this borne out. Look again at the text. He says, Don't let, middle of verse 3, Don't let anyone deceive you by any means as though this day has come, because first has to come the falling away, the apostasy. And the man of sin revealed, this apostasy is going to bring about the revealing of the Antichrist. But notice what it says. It's a message of hope. Who is the son of destruction. He's going to be destroyed. What does he do? Here is Paul's definition revealing of the abomination of desolation. What it calls in Hebrew, Hashikutz HaMishomim. He is going to oppose and he is going to exalt himself above all that's called godly or is God, godliness or worshipped. So that he, what does he do? He sits in, what does your Bible say? What does it say? The temple of God. It doesn't say temple. Here again, don't trust me. The word temple in Greek is the word heron. It's not the word heron. It's the word neos. Neos is sanctuary. What's the difference? Heron speaks about the entire temple structure. Neos speaks about the holy of holies, the holy place. Does any of your Bibles have sanctuary instead of temple? No. Sad. Sad. So it speaks here that the Antichrist is going to oppose, he is going to exalt himself against everything that is called godly or is worship. And what is he going to do? He is going to sit himself, where? In the Holy of Holies. Why in the Holy of Holies? This is where Messiah is going to rule during the Millennial Kingdom. Now, what is this place? Well, in the Holy of Holies, what is the chief vessel there? The Ark of the Covenant. I heard someone said mercy seat. They're right. We'll come to that. The Ark of the Covenant. On the Ark of the Covenant was what's called the Kaporet. That is the mercy seat. 
On each side of the caport were a cherubim. And remember, here's a citation, Numbers chapter 8. Is that right? Numbers chapter 8, I think verse 89. There it speaks about Moses going in to do something. He's dedicating the tabernacle for the beginning of worship. What worship? Tabernacle worship. They didn't have it. Something new. So Moses goes in the book of Numbers and he dedicates things and he approaches the Ark of the Covenant and he hears the voice of God speaking to him between the two cherubim from the mercy seat. Who was there? Shekhinat Hashem, which is the Shekinah glory of God. God's presence was there. Now, what we know is this. This is the seat of Messiah. And because the false Messiah is going to want to do the same thing, he's going to go into the holy place. He is going to go around the parochet, that veil. He is going to take his seat, this is what the scripture says, in opposition in order to exalt himself, wanting everyone to worship him. And Israel is going to reject. This is why Israel is going to go through this time of tribulation. So here's the thing we need to realize. Israel is going to be here during the wrath of God falling, but think for a moment of the paradigm. Passover, Egypt. In the Talmud, the exodus from Egypt is called the first redemption. And what's going to happen in the last days is called the final redemption. We learn a lot about the final redemption from the first redemption. And what did God do? See, if you read the book of Exodus carefully, you will find that God speaks there about how more and more Egyptians join to the children of Israel. Unto the fact that there was a great mixed multitude, meaning of different nations, tongues, languages, tribes, that joined together with Israel as they came out of Egypt. That's kind of an image of the church. And so what we find here is that the Antichrist, he's going to go in, he is going to say, worship me. And Israel is going to say, no. And God is going to allow Israel to go through this time of tribulation, not from his wrath, but from the Antichrist. Now, many people, as I said, they think that the rapture is being removed from the Antichrist. No. It's being removed from the wrath of God. See, here's something that I want you to see. We, if we're still alive, we are going to go through intense persecution. What did we say earlier? Yeshua said this. They hated me. They'll hate you. They persecuted me. They persecuted you. Many of them, many of you will be killed for my name's sake. And this view of the rapture, You've all seen the bumper sticker? You know, if the rapture happens, this car is going to be unattended. We talk about pilots, you know, disappearing and people on trains and planes and such. I don't think it's going to happen that way. And this is why. I think it's going to be very similar to the Holocaust. Believers are going to be round up. You come, where, where is Chaim? We don't know what happened to him. I bet they got him. They were here last night. I bet they took him. That's what's going to happen to believers. We're going to be put to death. You know, Revelation chapter 13, and speaking of the Antichrist, says that he makes war with who? The saints. And overcomes them. That's okay. You can overcome my physical body. It's not a problem, right? I'm going to get a new body. So, don't think of the rapture being this great testimony to the world. It's not. What's a testimony to the world is the suffering that we're going to go through. 
when the rapture happens, and it will be, I believe it's going to be at the end of a time that so many Christians are going to be arrested, put in jail, put to death, that it's not going to be this event that the news media is going to be speaking about. You know, even today, I think that much of the news media is already controlled by the enemy. It's not going to be speaking this as a testimony. The gospel is going to be testified by the angels, and we're going to support that with our faithfulness. But notice what the scripture says. Paul is speaking, and he says, the day of Messiah will not happen unless first takes place the abomination of desolation, where the man of sin is revealed. The one who's the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called of God or is worship, so that he himself sits in the sanctuary of God, proclaiming himself to be who? God. And he says, look at verse 5. Don't you remember that while I was yet with you, I told you these things? Verse 6. Now we come to a very fun part of the scripture. Because whenever this issue comes up, in fact, in the radio interview, someone asked a question. It's a great question. It's the right question to ask. But we need to understand what the scripture says and why certain doctrines are extremely problematic. Now, we're coming to verse 6. And notice what it says. And now you know what restraints. Is that what it says here? And you know what it is that's restraining. The question that we have to answer is what it is. Now, the most common response is this. It's the church or who else? The Holy Spirit. Now, we need to pay attention to all the scriptural indicators. Why is that? Well, the church, the Greek word for church, many of you know this, is ecclesia. It's feminine. The Greek word for, for spirit is pneuma. It's neuter. So many people teach that the Holy Spirit is going to be removed. Well, the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Trinity. And God, whether we're speaking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, in the flesh, Messiah wasn't all places. But, but he had knowledge of all things. Let me give you an example. John chapter 1. Remember when he spoke to, who was it, Nathaniel? And he says, you know, I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathaniel, you, you weren't there. How did He is not only omniscient. In a sense, because he's omniscient, he knows all things. And even though he's limited in that body during his incarnation, he was, in one sense, all places as well. He, he knew what was going on where he wasn't. So it's significant that you can't take away, and people associate their view as the Holy Spirit will be removed, and therefore the church is, or the church will be taken away, and so the Holy Spirit. Now, I agree there's a connection between the Holy Spirit and the church, but they're not one in the same. Would you agree with that? Not one in the same. And there's a problem. Because the first time that verb appears, and it appears twice, it's in the neuter. So you can't say it modifies the ecclesia, the church, because it's a neuter verb. It must take a neuter noun, and that's not the church. But you say it could be the Holy Spirit. Okay, I agree with you. Scripture has a way of, of answering itself. So look again at verse 6. And now you know, that kind of makes me feel stupid. <laughs> and now you know what is restraining for his revealing in his own time. So something is restraining the Antichrist from being revealed until God says, it's the right time. It's neuter. Perhaps it's the Holy Spirit. But here's where it gets interesting. Look now at verse 7. For the mystery of what? Lawlessness. Lawlessness. Over and over when we look at 
New Testament prophecy about the end times, there's that spirit of lawlessness. What does that mean? A hatred towards the Torah. What does that mean? A hatred towards, a lacking of the love, godly love. Loving God and loving your neighbor. Also, the term Torah has to do as well with the expectations of God. And people are not going to be interested in their God's expectations. They're interested in their own. So, once more, verse 7. For you know, or simply, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only the one, and there's a change. Remember I told you that that same word, what was it in verse 6? It was neuter. But now that same word appears and it's masculine. Now here again, some people, this is boring. Why are we doing this? It's scripture. It's grammatical indicators to give us wisdom. Now, most of the time in the past, I took this position. Because it's neuter and then masculine, you can't say what, but who. Does it say it here? Yeah. Only he, it's masculine, very good translation, who now restrains. Same word. What's the conclusion? I usually would tell people, I simply don't know. But it can't be the church. Because the church is feminine. And this week, I knew I was going to get a question, so I said, I'm just going to pray. What? And this is the main it's right, but what I, I came to the conclusion of is that we have something. We have a neuter referring to the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean that he's an it. I always call the Holy Spirit he. But he's referred in a neuter way, that nature. We find that many things. For example, the word life in Hebrew, singular, but it's chaim, it's in the plural. The word mercy, rachamim, plural, but we say it's singular. So we have this numerous examples. Then we have the masculine. And I believe it could be a reference to God or a reference to Messiah. They are holding him back until the right time. Look again, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already work only the one who restrains until he is removed from the midst. And that simply means stepping aside. It means going to a different location. It is a word of permission. See, what I think this tells me is this, that nothing is going to happen that God doesn't allow. That does not mean that he's the cause of it. It means that he's going to allow it. There's a big difference. So God is going to restrain, withhold the Antichrist from doing these things until the proper time. What do we know about the Antichrist? Last verse, and then we'll conclude. Verse 8. And then... The one of lawlessness, the one who's anti-Torah, what it literally says here. And the man of lawlessness will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth. You know what that means? How many of you have heard the word, Hebrew word, tikkun? No one? A couple, okay. It means to repair. It's a great word. It has rich theological significance in Judaism. One of the ways that Judaism refers to Messiah is the repairer. Mishe metaked, the one who repairs. Think for a moment of creation. One of the things we see in the Bible is the kingdom of God is, is likened to a second creation. Have any doubt about that? Look at the book of Zechariah, the language there for for Zechariah 14 and what God's going to do. Talks about stretching out the heavens, establishing the earth, just like he did in the first creation, so will be the kingdom of God established. 
And when God created the world the first time, how was it? What do you say? Okay. See, you jump to a conclusion that you ought not. I heard many people say, good. One person said, very good. That's not the case. It says that the earth was tohu vevohu, which means empty or void or formless. You always want to run through. Wait, patience. Okay. <laughs> It's significant that the world was created in this way. Tohu vevohu, in modern Hebrew, it can mean chaos. If you ask a rabbi, what does that mean? Just, they'll say, is seder, which means lack of order. There's no order. Now, the world did come to be tov me'od, very good, correct? How? God spoke it into being. He says, let there be light, and there was. Let there be, God spoke things into order. This is what we see here. We see that same thing, that he's going to defeat the lawless one, the Antichrist. He's going to be consumed by the spirit of his mouth. What is that speaking to? A word. He's just going to speak his, his message. Who's going to be consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed when? At the manifestation of his coming. So what this scripture is telling us is simply this. That the event that's so vital for us, when Paul speaks about our blessed hope, what he calls here, the day of Messiah, he says, beware. It, you haven't missed out upon it. Because that day will not come until first there's an apostasy. And the man of sin, the lawless one, is revealed. And it's not going to happen until God says it can. And then Messiah is going to return. And he's going to consume him by simply speaking. That's all. Just one word, Antichrist defeated. And this is all going to happen. This is all going to happen in light of Messiah's return. Now, here's the question. Does such a, a order bear itself out with the rest of Matthew 24? What is the sign of the rapture? What is the sign of the second coming? What does Messiah say about these same events surrounding the Antichrist, what he's up to, what's going to happen to the church, and what happens to Israel? Well, that's what we're going to talk about after lunch. <laughs> and the formation, the formation is this. We need to see, before we jump to the conclusion of Matthew 24, there's a principle that we have to affirm. And that is the distinctiveness or the distinction between Israel and the church. You, you get that confused, you're going to be in darkness about the last days. Father God, we thank you for who you are, your love, your faithfulness, your goodness, and your truth. Help us to stumble diligently, working with fervency, to understand, not man, but understand your scriptural revelation. Because we love you. We want to obey you. We want to be pleasing to you. We want to be found faithful. That our lives might be transformed so that your glory can be seen through us and people are moved to receive your son, that only Savior, the only name, under heaven, by which men must be saved. We thank you for your truth. In Yeshua's name, amen.